Welcome back to this week's technical. Remember, if you're new to the channel and you find this video interesting, don't forget to click subscribe, ring the little bell next to it. That means you get updates about new videos. Anyway, on with this week's topic. This week, the technical topic is one I've touched on before, but it's one of my hobby horses and I think it deserves its own video. It's something I hate to say it, most farmers are doing pretty badly, but more positively that any farmer could do something about tomorrow for a very modest investment, which could save them thousands and thousands of pounds. Although we're always looking for ways to refine medicine use on farms, they remain and will remain a very important part of our veterinary toolkit, not only in treating sick animals, but probably more importantly, in preventing them getting sick in the first place. On that second point, Vaccines are probably the most important veterinary medicines and probably medicines in general that we have access to. Accordingly, farmers invest a lot of money in these products. In fact, many of you farmers like to remind us vets sometimes about just how much you invest in them. Now, hopefully you have sat down with your vet, you've worked out what the return on investment is going to be for these products. And I don't just mean financial returns, but I mean returns in terms of animal welfare, in terms of your time, your well-being. We all have better and more fulfilling things to do with our time than picking up aborted calves, say, or chasing lame sheep to treat them, or again, picking up your best lamb because it's died of pastorella. Now one way to wreck that return on investment or ROI is for that product not to work and there are unfortunately many opportunities for that product not to work. Occasionally you get a bad batch from a manufacturer and that's why it's so important to record batch numbers when using medicines and in the cut and thrust of busy farm life medicines can be given at the wrong dose by the wrong route and if they require multiple doses at the wrong dosing interval and I'm afraid this isn't academic we see it as vets in practice all the time and it is backed up by the academic literature. But that's not what this technical is about. In fact, this technical is about one other major reasons medicines don't end up working and they end up being a waste of time and money. Before you use them, medicines have specific storage conditions. Most of these relate to temperature but also things like exposure to sunlight. Each product is different and the exact storage requirements can be found on the data sheet. That's either the physical sheet you can find in the box with the bottle, on the bottle, or if you've watched one of my previous technicals and you're in the UK, you'll find it on the NOAA compendium app. Many medicines simply want to stay at a sensible ambient temperature, something between freezing and 25 degrees Celsius. But others require a tighter and cooler range, and most of the vaccines we use, for example, would fall into this range. So they require it to be kept at a temperature of between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius. And it is really, really important that until the point of use, they are kept at this temperature. Live vaccines tend to fare worse when they overheat, whereas inactivated or killed vaccines tend to fare worse when they're frozen. But really, the message is the same. Keep them at that two to eight degrees Celsius. It's for this reason that as veterinary practices in the UK, at least, we are very strictly regulated by the VMD, the Veterinary Medicines Directorate. Products arrive to us refrigerated. They have to go straight in our fridge. That fridge has a readout temperature. It has an alarm if the temperature in the fridge leaves that two to eight degrees range. It records temperature minute by minute and it has to be regularly serviced and calibrated. We also have to review those temperature records on a regular basis. For those of you in Scotland and Northern England, you will remember Storm Arwen. For those of you who weren't there, it was a horrendous winter storm in November of last year and it left big areas of the UK without power. That includes our little practice in Rothbury. What that mean? It meant one of our fridges went to nine degrees for an hour or two. That doesn't sound like much, but because we have to take this seriously, we chucked all of that vaccine. That was about £10,000 worth of vaccine. And we're a small practice. In a bigger practice, it would have been many multiples of that. As vets, that's how seriously we take and we should take the storage of medicines. Now, you can tell me whether this sounds familiar to you. A farmer comes into town, they're going to do several jobs. First thing, they swing by the vets to pick up, say, a bottle of Heptavac. That gets set on the dashboard of the Land Rover. In the meantime, they go to the mart, they might go to the mechanic, they get chatting to a few friends, and before you know it, it's been a couple of hours. Now, that vaccine that sat on that dash or on the seat of the Land Rover is going to reach the ambient temperature within about 20 minutes. So, unless the ambient temperature within the car is between two to eight degrees, within 20 minutes, that vaccine has the potential to be rendered 
ineffective. But let's skip forward. Hopefully by the time you get on farm, it goes into a fridge. Fantastic. You've seen us take it out of our fridge and you're going to stick it in yours. A fridge is a fridge, correct? False. Again, tell me if this sounds familiar to you. The kitchen fridge you have in the house is starting to struggle a bit. It's starting to get a bit dated. You do a kitchen renovation, something like that. And you think, hang on, I'm not gonna chuck that fridge away. That's a perfectly good fridge. And the vet said I should have a fridge for my vaccine. So I'm gonna take that fridge, I'm gonna put it in a shipping container or a milking parlor or a farm outbuilding, and that is gonna be my vaccine fridge. I can totally see the logic. In fact, if I was a farmer, I can very much see myself doing that. But think about it. You're taking a fridge that's probably already starting to reach the end of its effective lifespan. You're taking it out of the well-insulated, temperature-regulated home. You're putting it in something like a farm outbuilding or a shipping container, like we said, where the range and fluctuation of temperatures is going to be more dramatic. And then you're sticking your vaccines in it, and they are far more valuable than your average household shop. Instead of putting this fridge out to pasture, you're asking it to run the Grand National. I'm sure I've shown you this tweet before from Ed Thrums, a practice in Perthshire. This is a really common issue, probably under-recognized and under-reported. All I can say is that's my lived experience, but is there a more objective study on this issue? Yes, there is. A couple of researchers alongside one of the drug manufacturers, MSD, set out to find out just how well farm fridges did. These researchers gave 17 farms temperature loggers. They look like this, they're little widgets with a USB port and they log temperature. These ones log temperature every 30 minutes. Each of the 17 farms got three temperature loggers. One sat outside the fridge to record the ambient temperature. Two sat inside the fridge, one on the upper shelf and one on the lower shelf, both towards the back of the fridge. These were fridges in the southwest of England and the researchers collected other data about them so they found out that all of them were domestic models rather than industrial models. Only five of the 17 fridges were dedicated to vaccine storage. Some of the other things kept in them included milk tests, colostrum, other medicines perhaps fair enough, household food and yes, even beer. Of the 17 fridges, eight were over 10 years old. So far, so expected. Now, again, perhaps unexpectedly, the performance of these fridges varied a lot, but just how much they varied is probably going to surprise you. I'm going to show you some of these in graph form. By the way, thanks to Geraldine Simpson at MSD who sent me these slides a couple of years ago to use in medicines courses. So here's the first one. Now, a quick explanation. Along that horizontal axis, that is the date. So that ranged from January to August to cover some of these seasonal extremes of temperature and on the vertical axis you have temperature in degrees celsius those dotted lines are at two degrees celsius and eight degrees celsius so essentially we want our fridges to stay within those two dotted lines that orange line is the ambient temperature recorded by one of the temperature loggers on each farm and the green and blue line represent the temperatures recorded from the temperature loggers in the fridge now the lines themselves are rolling one day averages but you can probably see some of the shaded areas that represent the 30 minute readings. Hopefully that's clear and if it isn't, say so in the comments, I'll try and clarify. This fridge is actually done pretty well. If you look at the rolling one day averages, it stayed from January to August within that two to eight degrees range, but it's not perfect. You can see that some of those green and blue shaded areas do manage to cross some of our two and eight degree limits. So this fridge, pretty good, not perfect. It's a similar picture for this fridge, except there's about a week in July where you can see suddenly it totally goes off the rails. It just seems to match the ambient temperature for those five or six days. The researchers never really got to the bottom of what happened here. They suggest the door's either been left open or there's been some sort of power interruption. And how about this fridge? It stays below two degrees C for pretty much the entire study period. And for much of it, it's below freezing. This is a better freezer than it is a fridge. As for this fridge, it coped reasonably well up until about May. And then you can see as the ambient temperature rises beyond a certain point, it just gets overwhelmed and it stays pretty much above that eight degrees. And as for this fridge, well, wow, all three temperature loggers pretty much match and mirror the ambient temperature. So this really isn't a fridge, 
it's a cupboard. And what really were the overall results like? All of the fridges at some point failed to maintain that two to eight degrees range. One fridge managed to get up to positive 24 degrees Celsius. Another managed to get to minus 12 degrees Celsius. And throughout each month of the study, an average of 59% had at least one temperature recording above eight, 53% had a temperature recording below two, and 41% of them had a temperature reading below low freezing. And when a similar study was repeated by Rosie Lyle when she was at Bishopton in North Yorkshire, the results were also not very encouraging. Between a narrower range of February and April, of 18 fridges, 88% of them recorded some reading outside of the 2 to 8 degrees range, and 43% of the fridges spent over half the time in the study outside of the two to eight degrees range. Now, hopefully I persuaded you that this is an area we could all do better at. I think the positive spin is, there's some low hanging fruit here. Of course, go and talk to your vet about this. Here are some of my suggestions. Number one, buy a temperature logger. You can spend a lot of money on these, but also you can get a half decent one for something like 30 quid on Amazon. Other online retailers do of course exist. These are probably a good entry point for those of you who are quietly confident that Yes, okay, 88% of fridges are knackered, but yours is fine. Leave it in there for a little while and set aside some time, maybe each week, maybe each month, just to download that data and see what it's saying. I can guarantee there will be a large percentage of you who are in for an unpleasant surprise. You can spend a bit more money and get some fancier models as well that have readout temperature and can even send you alerts on your phone when the fridge leaves the ideal range. Number two, think about where you're putting your fridge. If you're putting your fridge in a more challenging environment, it's more likely it's going to struggle. It's amazing how hot shipping can containers can get in high summer and it's amazing how freezing cold farm outbuildings can get in the depths of winter. By putting fridges in these places we're going to make their jobs a lot harder. Number three, buy a dedicated cool box or bag. Again this isn't big money we're talking about. Keep it in the ute or by the front door somewhere you're not going to forget it so you can keep your drugs cool in transit when you pick them up from the vets. Use it as well to store vaccine when you're using it but have yet to open it. So if you don't use it all you can return turn bottles to the fridge, safe in the knowledge they've been kept at a sensible temperature. You can also get fridges that plug into a car's cigarette lighter. That might be of interest to some of you. If you've got the space, try and keep drugs in the middle of the fridge, and that's because that's where the temperature is most stable. It tends to fluctuate more, say if you keep it in the door of the fridge or right at the back. If drugs are contacting the back of the fridge, they can freeze as well, obviously not ideal. Number five, keep a big bottle of water or two, depending on the size of your fridge and the capacity filled up and in the fridge. That water, for want of a better phrase, holds on to the temperature. It's going to help the fridge maintain a sensible temperature essentially by acting as a buffer. It's not going to fix a broken fridge, but it might buy you some time if you lose power or the door's left open. And number six, let's get flash. Buy an actual dedicated vaccine fridge. Now the cost is going to depend on the size, but in the UK you're looking at somewhere between 500 and 1500 pounds. And yes, I can hear you cringing and wincing through the lens. I understand this is not a glamorous or sexy way to spend a reasonable chunk of money, but if you look at it from a return on investment point of view, it is a very cheap insurance. No, I understand you don't get a free set of overalls with a fridge, and no, you can't use them as an expensive set of cattle hurdles. But if you have a reasonable sized flock or herd, you're going to have a significant amount of vaccine in that fridge. If you're looking at one of the smaller models, by the time you've bought a few big bottles of Heptavac P, you're going to be nearly there. Tot up your annual vaccine spend, I dare you, and then compare it to the cost of that fridge. And if the costs are just still too much to bear, consider buying one with a neighbor or neighbors that you trust, something that's still gonna be handy. That way you can still have vaccines within easy reach and you can split the cost of a fridge. And how about this? Consider getting some farms together, taking that interest to your vet practice or your local agri-merchant and seeing what rebate or discount they can get on your behalf. To be fair, we did try this at home, but being quite a small practice, we struggled to get much interest. It is though something I'd like to revisit in the near future. I know I must sound like I'm on my high horse and that's because I am and I make no apologies for that. I understand that no one goes to the pub or the mart and boasts about their new medicines fridge, but why not? Couldn't we change that? If you have a dedicated 
Made Farm Fridge. Send me a photo of it on social media and we can start this campaign to make fridges sexy. Likewise, if you end up going and buying a temperature logger, don't be afraid to share that data with your vet and if you're brave enough for it to go public with me if you like. I have noticed that love them or hate them, Red Tractor's recommendation and then requirement for farmers to sit a medicines handling course has started to get this on more people's radar. As you can tell, I think that is a positive change. That's me for this week. Farm fridges, I know what a strange topic to get animated about. For more mind-blowing content, don't forget to click subscribe if you haven't already. Ring the little bell next to it. If you have some feedback for me, if you think I'm talking nonsense, say so in the comments. And if you enjoyed the video, give it a big old thumbs up. See you next week.